of introducing our panel and also the topic for today. Social media, as I guess, you know, social media as it grows and grows, I know many of you probably right now are touching a computer, you're touching a mobile device as I speak, and I'm betting many of you are, are doing something social, and the number of folks using social media every day is getting so big it's staggering. I mean, the numbers really don't sink in. I mean, 650 million users of Facebook, uh, 175 million people will use Facebook in the next 24 hours. Uh, Twitter, there's 4 million tweets uh, per hour. Uh, 100 million users, including over 20 million now in Europe on LinkedIn. Over 17 million articles con contributed to Wikipedia. So it's, it's an unbelievable trend. It's actually a culture. It's a new way of living uh, that goes uh, well beyond just sharing photos of grandkids or children on, on Facebook but it's crossing into healthcare, it's crossing into life sciences, especially as it relates to the exploration and study of our genetic information. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, uh, to those listening on the call today, when I say there is uh, an unbelievable potential and profound, and the profound positive impact that we could all make uh, by combining social media and crowdsourcing and sharing uh, with genomics. And I think it's gonna make a huge impact on society over the next decade with over 23,000 SNPs already on Snippedia, over 100,000 uh, folks have already uploaded their genetic code to 23andMe. It's already happening, and we're going to try to answer some of the questions around the implications of this uh, with our group today, and that's why we've put together a, a tremendously, uh, tremendously experienced and astute group of panelists that we're happy to have with us. Uh, our first uh, panelist is Kevin Davis. Uh, many of you know him as the author and founding editor of BioIT World, and he's also the author of The Thousand Dollar Genome, which is his latest book, which is an account of the advances in DNA sequencing technologies and the impending revolution in personalized medicine. Uh, he's also a, a colleague of mine, as his organization is also uh, under the parents' company, CHI. So, Kevin, welcome. I'm assuming you've dialed in and are successfully uh, unmuted at this point. Kevin? All right, we'll work, up on, we'll work on Kevin and we'll come back to him. Our next panelist is Jonathan Eisen. He is a rev evolutionary biologist and a professor at the University of California, Davis, as well as the lead of the phylogenomics program at the Department of Energy's Joint Genome Institute. His research involves the sequencing of genomes micro or, of microorganisms and using phylogenomic methods to analyze genomic data. He's also active, an active blogger and author. We're very happy to have him here today. Jonathan, have you been able to uh, dial in? I'm here. I hope I'm un unmuted. You are. Great. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, our next panelist is Pilar Osario. She is the Associate Professor of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She was the director of genetics, the, gene, the genetics section at the Institute for Ethics at the AMA and taught as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Chicago Law School. She received her PhD in microbiology and immunology from Stanford and then her JD at UC Berkeley of Law. She's also worked for the federal program of ethical, legal, and social implications of the Human Genome Project. Pilar, have you been able to uh, successfully dial in here? I hope so. I can hear you just fine, so I hope you can hear me. We can loud and clear. Great. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. And last and certainly not least, and I know uh, our live audience uh, just heard his presentation, So, but uh, for those of you dialing in remotely, uh, our next panelist is Cam Patel. Uh, he is the senior member of the technical staff of Biosystems Research Group at Sandia National Laboratories where uh, new research approaches are being applied to national security issues, issues such as bioenergy and biodefense. Uh, Cam, are you with us? Uh, we need to unmute Cam. All right, we will get back to him. Kevin, are you, are you unmuted? Yes, uh, yeah, hi. Great, welcome. 
And then Janine, we just have to unmute unmute Cam, and we should be we should be all set. I'm going to jump into the first question here. I know we're pretty tight. We're pretty tight on time. Uh, the first question that we that we put forth in front of the group, and just so the audience knows, we're going to. We're going to pick and choose a little bit of who, who of our panel is going to address each question because we have so many questions we want to get through. And I've informed our panelists that even if the question sort of is not assigned to them, they may jump in with some informal comments. But I think this will help us stay on time. And I just want to start off at a very high level and talk about where personal genomics as an industry is today and where we think it's going to go in the next five years. And I think, Kevin, you're the you're a perfect person to, to start yeah. us off. Yeah, let, let, let me let me uh, uh, launch into that subject, uh, and thanks, Eric, and, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's been about, what, three and a half years, I suppose, since uh, 23andMe and uh, Decode in Iceland sort of launched this personal genomics industry. Uh, a couple of other companies of note along the way, Navigenics uh, and Pathway Genomics. But when it comes to direct-to-consumer genetics as an affordable uh, uh, entrance fee, uh, about $100 to $200, uh, we're really just talking about uh, 23andMe, and I'll, most of my remarks will be about them. Um, 23andMe has announced that, uh, as you had in your introductory slide, Eric, that uh, since launch uh, over the last three plus years, uh, more than 100,000 people now have um, uh, uploaded their genetic data. They've paid as little as $100 uh, in order to do that, to, to uh, be genotyped for as many as 1 million SNPs on the latest platform that 23andMe has introduced. And you get <coughs> four major kind of categories of information. You learn some stuff about your ancestry, maternal, paternal, as well as a nice tool called Ancestry Painting. You learn about your pharmacogenetic risks of, uh, uh, and ability to metabolize uh, and a whole number of different uh, drugs, uh, some of, of definite medical interest. Uh, you can learn about your carrier status, whether you carry mutations in uh, a growing number of um, disease genes for diseases including cystic fibrosis uh, and breast cancer, the uh, BRCA1 gene. And perhaps of, uh, m most controversially, uh, uh, an imputed uh, disease risk for much more common diseases like heart disease, obesity, um, uh, and diabetes, uh, which depends to some degree on the computational um, tools that each of these different companies are applying. And there's some variation there, and we'll probably talk more about that later in the, in the webcast. Um, uh, for me, uh, what, what really stands out about what uh, 23andMe and some of these other companies have introduced is the personal utility. It's not necessarily about medical utility. Indeed, all of these companies stress this is for informational purposes. This is not diagnostic information per se. Uh, but the personal utility, as illustrated by people like Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google and whose wife launched 23andMe, where he was able to learn about his genetic risk for Parkinson's disease because of a rare uh, hereditary mutation in a known Parkinson's gene, and then being able to use that information uh, to change his lifestyle, to perhaps change his uh, philanthropic efforts, or, or redouble them, is very valuable and empowering information. It may, it's not just about what you can learn uh, medically. Um, you talked about some of the uh, uh, d other data repositories that where, where you can find this information, um, Eric. Uh, uh, um, a number of genome pioneers who've publicly released their genome data have uh, put their information on places like uh, uh, Snipedia that you mentioned, uh, the Personal Genome Project through George Church, of course, blogs, and even, and even Facebook. They're, enabled to do that in part or reassured that they can do that because we have a federal bill called GINA, the Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act that provides um, a federal protection against genetic discrimination in the areas of em uh, employment and health insurance. Uh, how much teeth that legislation has, uh, I don't think anybody is entirely sure. Most of those cases that are currently in, in uh, dispute under that law, are, my understanding, is being referred to the EEOC, but uh, the results have not been, been made public. So. Um, as for the future of personal genomics, I mean, clearly the companies are pushing forward. The big uh, elephant in the room is the FDA, which has been holding hearings as to whether this should be uh, regulated. We don't know what the best business model uh, for this industry is going to be, whether it's going to really uh, be companies like uh, 23andMe uh, driving the consumer, direct-to-consumer route, or whether companies that are kind of playing more within the medical infrastructure like Navigenics or, or Decode may end up having a, a more profitable business model, uh, time will tell. 
And of course, with the rapidly falling uh, cost of, of sequencing and next generation sequencing uh, with prices now at sort of $5,000 and below, um, it, it's probably only a matter of time before uh, some of these companies uh, elect to, to introduce tiers of, of exome or even whole genome sequencing. I think that can, uh, that's definitely a trend that we'll have to uh, watch out for. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it there and, uh, and maybe invite Jonathan to add some comments. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you've covered uh, a lot of the ground for what's um, on the horizon in the next few years. I mean, I think that we will talk a little bit about this further, that sharing and social networking and integration with social media is definitely something that's happened. Uh, certainly 23andMe takes advantage of that within 23andMe, at least, but we're probably going to see this expanding outside of 23andMe more and more into other social networks. One other thing I just want to mention is that I think maybe past five years or depending on the technology, we're also going to see a lot of push into other aspects of personal genomics like variation within individuals um, for things like the cancer genome projects and comparison of your, say, cancer cells to your background genome. And another area which is certainly growing and might eventually merge with the personal genomics field is studies of the microbes that live in and on people, the human microbiome project and your own personal microbiome is probably going to eventually be integrated with analysis of your personal genome. That's great. That's interesting stuff. You know, I, I, I'm not going to go down this route, but certainly uh, what I find actually to be another, Kevin mentioned the white elephant in the room is the FDA. I mean, the other smaller elephant or elephants is sort of the medical community and how quickly physicians start uh, getting involved with companies like 23andMe and the like and understanding really the implications, a little bit more about the implications of the data that their patients are bringing to them and how they encourage that or not. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on and get a little bit more of, tied into social, which I know is, is a big interest, has a big interest with everyone here on the call. And, and that's really, you know, what what's the role of, of, of not only Facebook, but some of the other social media giants in, in accommodating or repeating the sharing of all this information? And I know I outlined these huge numbers at the beginning, and I thought maybe, Cam, I know you're now on the line. Maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about this. Sure. I think, can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. I want to make sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Facebook is, you know, if, if for nothing else, it's, its sheer size and acceptance uh, in the general population and communities is uh, a force to be reckoned with in terms of uh, its impact or what it can do in terms of personalized health and personalized health information, um, you know, if it's the right format or not. But it's the interconnectivity that uh, uh, these uh, social media giants can provide us is that uh, – it's, 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 we've never seen anything like that yet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about you guys, but I email my doctor constantly regarding certain situations, lab results and things. But it'd be very interesting if my doctor could follow my Facebook page and watch my uh, recovery and, you know, post information along with other fellow colleagues who are having similar types of ailments or recovery aspects or give me hints and tips. And it's this, this aspect of um, you know, non just not just factual information, but the the intangible informations and the support groups and the tips that you can provide through this uh, integration of all different aspects is what this platform I think can deliver for the future. Um, so I think that that's kind of really a, a unique feature. What you know, like a, kind of a Facebook like social media uh, platform can provide us, and uh, the, the, you know the. It's just the the sheer volume is, is very impressive. You, know, you have access to, as you know, the numbers that you mentioned earlier regarding the number of people accessing Facebook in 24 hours just should give you that this is one common denominator that we can use and implement uh, for uh, bringing people together in terms of uh, their health-related information. So but there's, you know, things we have, like any other new technology or new implementation, there's, there's you know, good things about it that people in the optimistic world can view, but there's also the pessimistic view of that it could bring a lot of uh, bad results and uh, capabilities of people trying to exploit the information and things of that nature. So those are the things that we have to overcome 
along with uh, kind of the legality of uh, advice that's being given, you know, does the medical community be held liable, and, you know, all these things get worked out like anything else, any of their technology. So um, I'll leave it at that and let some of the other uh, colleagues chime in on their opinions. So, so Jonathan, you know, how does, you know, people are already doing this, right? I mean, there's a shot of someone who's actually putting their own genome right up on Facebook. So how, how do things like open access and, and crowdsourcing extend sort of to the personal genome, to personal genome information, and, and how would that impact someone like, someone like you and your peers who are, who are working on this stuff? Well, I mean, one issue with the use of Facebook and the discussion we've had so far is that Facebook is not, it's semi-open. You know, if you can figure out how to navigate the privacy settings, you can control at some level who gets access to what you're posting within Facebook. And, you know, you have a social circle, but that is limited. There's another area of scientific research that's been pushing the boundaries of openness much further than that, which is, you know, generally called open science. And it's becoming much more common in, certainly in research labs. And, you know, there's open source software, there's open data release, there's open access publishing. There are even people who post their lab notebooks online in some open manner. And at the same time, there's also been this push for citizen science type projects, you know, with individuals and even groups participating in some sort of shared open science project. And there are, you know, hundreds of examples of this now from birds, surveys, to weather data collection, to space studies, to even people monitoring their baby's behavior or something to that effect. And, you know, there are hundreds of these projects out there that do citizen science. And what I think you might start to see more and more of is the merging of open science and citizen science and personal genomics. And you certainly see a couple of examples of that out there now with the Personal Genome Project, which um, was already mentioned uh, very briefly, that George Church and others are coordinating where um, people are sort of signing up to posting their genome data online with an open Creative Commons license associated with that data. But probably more importantly, they're not just posting the sequence information, they're trying to post personal medical histories and uh, personal information, maybe even relative information if uh, you have that. And so, and that's being released in sort of a broadly open manner such that anybody can make really any use of that information in some sort of scientific research or other area. And I think that, you know, there's many other examples of this starting up. There's this Genomes Unzipped project. There's do-it-yourself genomes. There are a variety of others that are trying to take the sort of open science platform and merge it with personal genomics. And I think you're, you're going to see more of that. There are issues that come up with that related to, um, you know, uh, discrimination, whether or not there are legal protections in the United States, they might not extend to other areas, um, whether or not there's uh, informed consent for, say, relatives when you post that information. I mean, there are lots of questions that come up related to open science in the context of personal genomic and personal medical information, but there's no doubt you're going to see that increasing. That's actually a great segue, so that's great TF to uh, some questions that, at least one question I wanted to ask Pilar, and that's, you know, I'm hesitating here if we should kind of skip, and I have actually two questions for you, Pilar, but uh, we'll go first with the, who, who owns the information once it's on a social media platform, and then I have a quick follow-up to that around legislation. Okay, well, um, actually, so in thinking about this, I think ownership is just the wrong word to use here. <laughs> Because what we really care about is who can do what with that information that pertains to me, such as my genotype or sequence data, once it gets on um, some social networking site. So we're really thinking about use rights and privacy interests. Ownership interests, we think of that in the context of things like real property like land or personal property like stuff. Um, whereas data, the kinds of ownership interests we tend to have in data would be either uh, copyright, which really doesn't directly apply to my genome information itself, although it might apply to 
a representation of that information that a company might create, in which case the company would have the copyright and they might license me to use it for some things if I paid to have my genotype done by them or my sequence done. And then I would have to know whether I even had a right um, to put my genetic information on a social network site. Um, similarly, we have patents, right? And But when I pay to have my some genetic testing done, um, generally I'm paying to extinguish the patentee's right over that information as it pertains to myself. But again, I might be only getting a license, and then I would have to know, does that license allow me to put my genetic information up on a website somewhere? Um, so even though it's genetic information about me, actually somebody else might at least own the representation of it or um, control what I can do with it. Supposing that I do have an unlimited right to use my genetic information or to post it wherever I want to, um, and I post it on a social networking site, then our questions are what could other people do with it? So for instance, what could the owner of the site do with it? And that would depend totally on the contract between you and the social networking site. So it may be that in the contract it says that the site itself has some um, right to use things that you post there or to pass them on to third parties. So that's something that you have to learn by reading the contract with the site. Um, and it might be that whether the site has that, that opportunity to use your information depends on how you set your privacy settings. So again, that's something that the user has to learn and there's no overall answer to that and there's no sort of statutory rule about this. It's just all a matter of contract law. Then the other question is, what could other users of the site do with that information? Um, and as a general matter, in part, well, there is no general answer to this and it's not like the courts have looked at this question. In the United States, we don't have any overarching data privacy law. We do have GINA, as was mentioned before. So GINA, um, GINA is there to prevent employers or health insurers from using your genetic information to uh, make employment decisions or health insurance decisions, health insurance coverage decisions. Um, and I think as was mentioned earlier, I, and I completely agree with the previous speaker who said, we don't really know how much teeth that's going to have yet. Um, and from a lawyer's perspective, it's often hard to prove that somebody used the um, the protected information, especially if somebody's put it on a public website. So you know we do have that. But other than that, um, what you know what uses might other third parties make of this information? Well, my suspicion, based on other areas of the law, is that courts would look at this and say you have probably, if you put it on a networking site, that any number of people have access to, then you've essentially given it away. And whatever privacy interest you had in that information, um, you relinquish that privacy information when you put it up on a social networking site. So I think I would just stop there. So, and I'm going to go a little bit off script here because we're getting a couple of questions uh, via Twitter. And, and, I, and I think you know, you answered this, but I just want to make sure. I'm, we're clear. I mean, the question is, could a, could a representation of genomic data then be copyrighted? Um, yes, possibly. So it would depend on whether it's copyrightable or not, would depend on the sort of how creative that representation is. But I'm assuming that there, are, you know, representing information is something separate than the underlying information. So the representation may be something creative enough to be copyrighted, yes. Great. And, and incidentally, so we're, Folks listening in, hashtags NGSL if you want to submit questions. You could also do it through the WebEx. Uh, and then we'll also take some questions, uh, hopefully, if we have time from the live audience as well. So, Pilar, I'm, I'm going to ask you another follow-up question. I'm going to go mm -hmm. a little bit out of order from our script here and, and ask you what legislation do you think we need potentially down the road to protect, to better protect maybe an individual's rights as we anticipate this explosion of NGS and, and social media? Well, um, you know, that's an interesting question because I do think that um, we need some kind of regulation of the quality of the information that people are getting. Um, and that's sort of something prior to the use of the social media. But um, whatever benefits we think are going to come out of this, those benefits are unlikely to materialize if the information people are getting, if it's incorrect um, and inaccurate 
and you know not well validated and things like that. Um, and so the quality of the information and the claims that are made by the people who generate the genetic information. We already have some legal protections in those areas. The FTC, for instance, um, the Federal Trade Commission, regulates um, advertising claims, and so they have had some role in uh, tamping down on some kinds of claims that are made by various companies about the value of genetic information that they might be uh, generating. FDA also has some role in this regard. That law is already in place. Also, the law that would allow the FDA to regulate um, to regulate genetic testing more, that law is there. The FDA has just chosen not to use their – they've chosen to exercise enforcement discretion and not to enforce the law. And whether or not they will choose to do that and how they'll choose to do that remains to be seen. Um, so that's one thing. I think that's – it's not – doesn't go directly to the social networking aspect, though. So with respect to the social networking aspect, I don't think that there is any law that would or should protect people if they choose to give their information unreservedly to the public. Um, and what people need is education to understand what the possible consequences of that would be. Uh, and I know we've had mention of the, the Personal Genome Project and George Church's project once or twice. and. I would just point out that he doesn't just let anybody participate in this. And first of all, it's his project is still pretty expensive to be a participant, so that weeds out a lot of people. But also, he has people in some cases go through an entire genetics class, for instance, so that they understand the implications of of the information that they're going to be put out putting out in the public. So I think you know that's. He's not simply saying, oh, this is without risk and without consequence. And he's asking that people have a very, very high level of education before they make the choice, which is, I think, very responsible of him. Um, and I think, you know, as a general matter, no privacy law is going to protect you if you give your information to the public. It, it won't and it probably shouldn't because you've relinquished your privacy interests. Um, and, and, we aren't going to be able to legally regulate things like stigmatization. We're just not going to be able to do that. So I think it's more a matter of, of educating people uh, and having them be reflective about the benefits and the risks. And it may be in many cases they'll decide that the benefits outweigh the likely risks or they're willing to take the chance, and that's just fine. That's great. You've actually obviously hit a nerve here because there's a bunch of questions coming in. I will try to get to them. I'm going to circle back to Pilar in a moment. I don't, I don't want to kind of stay on this legal tangent here, but we are going to come back to it because I can see a lot of folks are interested in it as, as they're putting up their questions. Uh, Cam, let, let's talk a little bit about when information on these networks are are being used to, or platforms I should say, are used to calculate correlations, you know, made to socially sensitive traits. We know sort of your IQ test, race, uh, you know, likelihood of being uh, attached to substance abuse or, or things like that. What are some of the what are some of the implications there? Yeah, I think we've touched on some of this already uh, in terms of the implication and kind of regulate regulatory type uh, aspects of this. But uh, you know, the key thing that comes to my mind is you know the, the fear. Uh, associated with misrepresentation and the fact that we can you know, just oversimplify, uh, you know, deriving, you know, a, a kind of a direct correlation from a genetic uh, makeup to the, uh, a, a, a specific trait like race or, um, you know, uh, an IQ or, or, or some kind of uh, physical trait. And it kind of reminds me, I'm, I don't know if you guys are familiar from a movie a while back called Gattaca where <laughs> Uh, it's, it's actually quite relevant today than it was back when it was uh, first uh, produced. But you know, when when those types of information at an early age predefines who you are and what you're capable of doing, um, you know, it's it's one label and one compartmentalization of how uh, society puts on you. So it it could have some pretty interesting ramifications um, for the future. But it's the it's the oversimplification of this that I think we have to be careful of. Um, 
we, can, we don't want to get too 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 detailed in interpreting that just because of this you're destined or you're going to have this kind of outcome and I think that's what uh, the, is the fear and we have to overcome so but you know the aspects of this is, is is quite interesting you know especially from companies you know there's one thing to do this for an intellectual perspective and uh, you know for for a, you know benefit to society if you can you know take and correlate and find trends amongst populations to help from a a uh, public health perspective but when there's companies involved that exploit this information uh, particularly for financial gain that's when uh, also interesting uh, legal perspectives and things come into play. You know, if you're specifically targeted by a drug company based on your genetic makeup, that you have a you have a susceptibility to skin cancer, so they're going to market skin creams to you. You know, so those those kinds of situations becomes uh, kind of interesting of how these may be perceived for the future and what's the motive motivation behind um, the the uh, the collection and the aggregation of the data. So yeah, it's definitely a, a touchy situation, and it, uh, it it comes full circle to a lot of the issues around social media. It's like, uh, well, who has access, and what are they going to do with it? It's mm -hmm. great. Hey, I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Maybe Cam, you could you could be my my eyes and ears. If there's questions from the live audience, uh, sure. Please interject, and we'll take one. I'm going to take one more. Uh, from our remote audience right now, and I know it's. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put Kevin and and Jonathan on the spot here, and, and and the question comes up is why is the medical community so behind in the use of this information? <laughs> well, I mean, some of this information. This is Jonathan. Some of this information is very expensive, so there is a component to it where people haven't been using it in clinical diagnostics because it's expensive, but that's clearly not the only reason because they use make use of other expensive things. I think a component of it is they don't know what they would do with the information. I mean, I think people getting their genome characterized and using 23andMe, which I've done myself, um, it's very interesting and it has potentially some useful information, but in a mm -hmm. clinical setting, it may not be right now that different from say getting typed for a select set of alleles that you do you know not by a genomic survey so i mean i think that's certainly a component of it yeah i would um this is kevin davis i would follow uh, uh on from that i mean we have to stress that this is incredibly preliminary information i mean the companies by definition say that this is not diagnostic information it's information that uh, can, in some cases, be empowering. But what distinguishes one of the one, one of the differentiators between all of these companies is that they all apply different algorithms. They all have different ways of computing what your potential risk is based on your particular set of variants in a cluster of genes, which may or may not be the same for each disease, depending on which company you're looking at. Um, and thus, the, the results are inconsistent. And this has been pointed out. Uh, publicly for you know, two or three years. Craig Venter and colleagues had a commentary in Nature that uh, drew a lot of attention a couple of years ago when they looked at five anonymous people and showed really quite dramatic differences in the sort of up or down risk trends based on, on, on different gene tests from, from some of the major consumer genetic companies. So I think uh, there's two issues. You know, the medical geneticists, your GPs are, A, they're not well trained in genetics. Everyone knows that. And there's a lot of catching up to do and a lot of initiatives around the country to build uh, awareness and train the next generation of medical professionals to be much better and uh, informed onto the, onto the possibilities of genetics. But uh, you know, we, we've still only scraped the tip of the iceberg in terms of identifying the genetic contributions for the common and complex traits. That, so that when you go to your doctor saying, I think I have a, a higher risk of type 2 diabetes or heart disease, um, to some extent I sympathize with the GP who, who, who's going to be very skeptical. Um, and the onus is on these companies and the community as a whole to start to ferret out more of these genes. Having said that, I have no doubt that uh, they, will, they will indeed be able to do that, but it's going to take a few more years. This is Pilar. Could I add just one one thing to this also? Perfect. Yeah. Because I think that 
uh, we're to some degree answering one of the questions that came in on the chat. How different is this from someone publishing their autobiography, not when they're 80, but when they're 25? <laughs> um, so that was a question that came up on the chat, and it seems like um, we've partially answered this, that the information as yet is not all that predictive, that there are still lots of questions about it. Um, and one of the problems with that is that it may then allow people to draw unwarranted conclusions about the implications for somebody else or for themselves. Um, but another thing about all this information from the medical perspective is that we haven't yet shown that having good, sort of accurate, strongly predictive genetic information will actually help people to change their behaviors or do things that would improve their health. Um, and, you know, we all know that if you have high blood pressure, that is a predictor for various kinds of future health problems, and yet getting that information doesn't necessarily cause people to change their behavior in ways that improve their health. <laughs> so I think we have to be cautious about thinking that simply knowing an individual's genotype um, or particular aspects of their genotype will lead in some direct and predictable way to better health outcomes, because yeah, we that certainly haven't Kevin shown Davis. that yet. This is Kevin Davis. There was a study, and this may be the one that you're referring to, uh, Pilar, that uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year from a group at Scripps uh, who applied, who gave navigenics tests to uh, at least a couple of thousand uh, volunteers, pretty well-educated volunteers, I think, for the most part. And the good news was that there was absolutely no evidence of any kind of worry or concern or that you often hear from people in the bioethical community that, wow, people just aren't going to be able to handle this information, right. which I think is ridiculous for the most part. But on the other hand, there wasn't any strong evidence that people were jumping on this. Uh, a little, a few trends here and there. But uh, in defense of the study, uh, th these people were s surveyed only after three to five months uh, of actually receiving their results. And th this is going to be the subject of a, uh, several long-term follow-ups. So we'll follow that with some interest. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And and they did show a slightly higher intention to have certain screening tests. Yeah. But again, I, I think it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And we really yeah. actually need the real data. And that is also a very select group of early adopters with a very, very high interest as opposed to the average person. So it's not clear how generalizable those data will be. But Okay, before I move on to the next question, we have a couple of Gina questions, of course, uh, Pilar, that have been prompted by your, your initial comments. But a any questions from the live audience, Cam? I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, we had a, a presentation here by Mike Snyder um, kind of expressing his personal experience with, uh, uh, he did a longitudinal study of about a year and a half of uh, his, uh, his personal genome where he would sequence himself on a kind of regular basis through uh, a course of um, looking at all the, all the compartments and all the omics from genomics, proteomics, metal, metabolomics, and, and such. And it was interesting that, um, you know, through his year and a half of sequencing himself over a significant portion of time, uh, through uh, two different viral infections, um, and he was able to correlate some pretty interesting aspects of the infection to his susceptibility and things of like that. And one of the things he found out along the way is uh, his uh, risk for type 2 diabetes. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, he was able to use the genetic information to, you know, t to make him aware of this uh, unique pos position and, you know, correlate that with some of the traditional tests for uh, glucose for H1AC and and such that it actually translated into actionable items and uh, actually translate uh, him to change some aspects of his life change. So there's just one example um, where, you know, somebody taking an in-depth look at their genome and, uh, you know, tracking it with time and seeing the changes in trends. It's not kind of this absolute thing, once you do it, that's it. It's, it's tracking it through time and watching how it impacts your lifestyle and uh, different aspects of it. I think we have a question here in the audience, so. All right, uh, go great ahead. Discussion. Sorry, can I go on? Go ahead. Okay, uh, this is fabulous discussion. Just had a, had a question, and it's actually a rehashing of something that's already been mentioned here is, um, you know, now we know we have lots of data, and this is the sort of the era of data interpretation, and people 
all of us in the bioinformatics community know that there is, you know, there is a data and there is metadata, and it's a really the bringing the juxtaposition of the two that completes the story. So when you're talking about, you know, releasing data on social networks, uh, is it just my genome, the sequence genome, my 23andMe output that's being put up there? And, and 50 of us can do that, but really how does that um, help us interpret data without knowing, say, what my predispositions might be? Growing up in India, what kind of, you know, what kind of mi microbial environment or what kind of environment I've been exposed to and how that might be impacting certain things that are being observed in my genome right now, as opposed to somebody else whose genome might have similar picture, similar reflection, but for different reasons. And it's not entirely clear to me that how we propose to bring the two pieces together, are people willing to share also the parts of their lives, you know, what they have done before, their eating habits, their exercise habits, their drinking habits, what have you, to help us interpret. And, and so that's one, one side of the story. And the other thing is, you know, as Mike presented this morning, he also talked about a technical aspect of phasing, for example, where he had his mother genome sequenced as well to add, to give us additional information. So there are kind of two sides to the story, something more technical and something that's really private. And I'm not sure to what extent people will sort of bring together all these pieces of the puzzle together to actually make a cohesive picture for the rest of us. Uh, this is Jonathan. Maybe I can address this first. I mean, I think you certainly see with, say, George Church's project that the emphasis there is clearly not just on the raw genomic or genomic type of data, but on the personal medical history and on, you know, what you could call the metadata about individuals and on releasing that information in some sort of open manner for a select group of people with the goal of being able to do those comparisons that you were suggesting. For many other people, they are maybe comfortable downloading their data or uploading their data to some site, their genome data, but you're probably right that they might be much less inclined to share other information about themselves, um, which, of course, would make it the data more useful for scientific purposes, but it doesn't necessarily prevent people from making use of the data. You could always scan Facebook and other sites for personal information and use it indirectly. This is Kevin Davis. I, I would uh, uh, add that you know, 23andMe is in itself a, a, a thriving social networking, crowdsourcing site, and we we haven't really pointed out that by sort of gathering data and combining, marrying the the genotypic data, which of course they have in their database, with voluntarily submitted phenotypic information from their client base, getting people to fill in surveys on all kinds of traits and medical conditions they've been able to you know, make some very exciting genetic discoveries. They had a great paper published last summer in uh, one of Jonathan's Public Library of Science open access journals uh, showing that the, the proof of principle that they could that this, this approach worked, albeit for sort of rather trivial traits, such as the ability to smell asparagus in your urine. Uh, but uh, they've now applied that to something like Parkinson's disease. And I don't, although the paper's not yet been published, they've reported that they found two novel gene associations with Parkinson's disease by taking the four or 5,000 members of their community who are Parkinson's patients and sufferers uh, and collecting information on them. So uh, we're seeing the value of, of crowds sourcing and, and combining this sort of genotypic and, and uh, phenotypic information, which I think is phenomenally exciting. L let me also add, and I know we only have a, about seven more minutes, uh, according to my clock, and we do have a bunch more questions, and I, I want to let the other panelists address the one that we're talking about right now. But uh, for those of you both on site and, and, and remote, we're going to try to continue some of this discussion uh, through through our forum on NGS leaders. So I'm going to take, in the spirit of, if you post your question publicly, you sort of lose ownership of it. I'm going to take all of these questions and we're going to put them up uh, on the uh, on the discussion forum at NGS leaders and try to continue this conversation uh, asynchronously uh, throughout the next uh, couple of weeks. But I don't know if Cam or, I guess Cam, you're the only one that hasn't commented on this last question, if you want to get into it or if you want me to move on to the next, next question. Could, could you repeat that real quick? Well, was the question asked live at the audience, from the audience? 
I don't know if you had any comments. I don't want to cut you off. The data, there's two different types of data. There's right. the personal data, and then there's also the metadata and uh, how those could be mined and used. Definitely. I mean, you know, the metadata could be very encompassing of so much more information that uh, you could possibly need. I mean, it's how do you par parse all it? it it's, it's the interpretation of the com combination of the two and the, the knowledge behind it that's uh, the important aspect of it. And uh, it, I, I don't think the genome is enough to give you information, but the, yeah, linked with the metadata is, is quite powerful and uh, it's it could, uh, it, it's already proving in the scientific realm that uh, looking at the meta, metadata from just looking at the nasopharyngeal swabs of genomic content relative to the microbiome of different uh, healthy individuals varies quite considerably. And then when you begin to look at diseased states or diseased individuals in, in, against that, you can pull out specific uh, um, markers and uh, biomarkers to help uh, predict different uh, aspects of it. So it's really the metadata and the uh, um, the life history of the individual that could uh, impact how the genome is interpreted. Interpreted. This is Pilar. Can I just speak to this question a little bit also? Um, sure. So I, I'm an advisor for the NIH's uh, Human Microbiome Project, and that project is collecting enormous amounts, of course, of what uh, what you might call metadata, although I always laugh when I hear that as an ethicist. I think describing the genome as the data and everything else about the person as the metadata, <laughs> it's a very genome-centric way of thinking about the world. <laughs> but um, be that as it may, uh, you know, this project has 250 people, or actually more than that now, who have given enormous amounts of information about themselves. That's just for the microbiome project. And then there are the demonstration projects that go with it that also are asking, you know, amazing amounts of information about individuals. One of the things that researchers have seen is that people who participate and choose to participate understand that these data are going, in this case, they're going into a controlled access database that um, will, it will be available to many, many researchers around the world, but NIH has some control over that. And that seems to matter to people. So they will, the people who choose to participate in this project, knowing that there's a certain amount of release of their data, that it's going to be pretty widespread potentially, they still will talk about how they trust researchers and NIH to do the right thing. So one of my questions, and it's just an open question, is whether people, um, how will people feel when we're talking about a sort of a, a, an ordinary social networking context where it's not about just trusting people who are, who somehow get a seal of approval by NIH or some some scientific authority that has uh, you know, that has a relatively good reputation. So it's not clear to me that people are going to be so trusting about putting the rest of their medical information and life history information online. And it's also, I mean, I think it's a question for all of us as to whether we should be encouraging people to do that in order to further our research or whether there are other ways to further research. Um, and I, I personally don't have an answer to that question, but I think we ought to be asking it of ourselves. Uh, this, just, this is Jonathan Eisen, one comment about that. I mean, I think that's part of the success of 23andMe's model is the limited distribution of that information as opposed to the broad public distribution of that information. Do we have another question from San Francisco? Any, any further questions from here? I don't think so. Okay. Um, we have, uh, how, so I'm going to, I think, Jonathan, I'll start with you and I'll probably circle to Kevin and go through the line again. But the question is, can the group give an educated guess on when they think genetic sequencing is going to become a standard clinical practice? Uh, yeah, I mean, I probably can't give that a guess because there's, it's not just a technical cost issue. I mean, I think from a, 
cost point of view and from a technical point of view, it's possible to do that very soon. But I think from a medical benefit and regulatory point of view, maybe other people can comment on that. I, who knows when that's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, obviously, cost and technology, we're see, you know, seeing exciting trends. Just last week, there was a paper in Science Translational Medicine in which the twins of uh, the, the chief information officer at Life Technologies were diagnosed. They've been suffering from seizures and uh, uh, some, some mystery disorder, and uh, the gene was identified by a whole genome sequencing. Um, other cases from Wisconsin and, and, uh, and elsewhere have uh, attracted huge publicity in the last few months. Uh, and uh, the group in actually at the Medical College of Wisconsin is, uh, will be uh, posting an, an exclusive interview on a podcast uh, shortly at BioIT World uh, with Liz Worthy at the Medical College there um, have now made this kind of almost uh, a semi-routine procedure where cases, pediatric patients who uh, have undiagnosed and serious disorders are now, can now be considered for whole genome sequencing uh, outsourced to Illumina. Um, and in some cases, even getting health insurance companies to, to reimburse for the cost of that sequencing, which is an exciting development in and of itself. And some of those diagnoses uh, have proved, uh, uh, have, have been positive. Um, in some cases, bringing tremendous medical benefits. In, in other cases, simply sparing the families from uh, undergoing expensive and emotionally uh, traumatic uh, medical treatments and surgeries when there, there may be no hope and no, no known treatment or no known cure for a particular disease. And that's valuable information in itself. I'm somewhat ducking the question as to when this will become routine because, as I said earlier, there's a huge amount of medical education uh, that needs to be done. But uh, as the technology whereby a whole genome sequence can be obtained for less money than a patented uh, single gene test for, for example, the breast cancer gene, I mean, we're almost there. So uh, you can't put your head in the sand. Uh, this, is, this is coming and it's coming fast. And just a quick reminder, I did for the remote folks uh, put up the survey that, so you guys could provide us some feedback. This would be a great opportunity also if you wanted to pick and choose some of the subtopics that came up today and request that we cover them in, a, in their entirety or more in their entirety to a full 60-minute session. So it's a great way to give us some feedback and we, we read these things immediately and act upon them. Uh, Pilar, and I don't know if Cam's still with us. I don't know if the, the conference group uh, signed off, but uh, if, if you wanted to comment on this before we move on. Well, I guess the only thing I would add is that, you know, we are still working in the medical context on getting uh, genetic tests for individual genes or uh, markers approved and actually integrated into clinical care. And so I, I completely agree that while technically I think it's coming very fast, the ability to sequence or certainly, I mean, we've already got the ability to genotype whole genomes that we could be integrating into the clinical context. Um, I think it's going to be a while before we're actually able to make use of this technology in an intelligent way in the clinics. And I, I, I hesitate to put a particular number, such as a decade or something like that, on the clinical integration, but I think it's going to take a little while. All right. So we're going to end with one, this one last question. It's an interesting one. I'm going to, Pilar, this is definitely in your sweet spot. I'm going to have you go last, though, because I'm going to put everyone else on the spot and get their sort of opinions on it, because I think there's not only legal, but there's ethical uh, connotations to the answers here. And the question, and I'll paraphrase, is, you know, your personal data is already an obligatory part of your personal identification, and the example is when you enter the U.S., so will the information regarding your personal genome the mic and your microbiome, would that be, do you think that's going to become in the future obligatory uh, for things like entering the country as technology advances and this information is much more easily accessible for us? You know, is there a line between privacy and national security, for instance? So why don't we start? We'll go Kevin, Jonathan. I think Cam, you're off, right? I don't, I don't hear Cam, so I think he's off, and then we'll, we'll end it with Pilar. Somehow I don't really see my, my friendly customs agent or, or, or a, a security 
guard uh, taking a microbiome swab or something and putting it into a into a scanner. But uh, you know, certainly. But, it, but it's some, if the information is already there, the question I think. I mean, I'm, I'm trying now. I'm taking the person who's asking the question and, 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 and mm. getting in their head. But you know, will this information be something that they could just click on a button and access it from a database? Uh, having sung the, the praises of technology uh, in other areas, uh, you know, I would never say never. So, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine um, this happening anytime soon, but I certainly think from a national security point of view and a emerging infectious disease point of view, you could, you might expect people to be doing nearly real-time surveys of people entering the country for microbes that are on them. I don't know what they do with that information, but they're already doing screenings in various countries for body temperature and other things related to, say, SARS. So microbes, I think, would be more likely than personal genomic information. Pilar? Yeah. Um, so. You know, I don't have any better insight into the answer to this question than anybody else does, but I do know that there are uh, people who are developing technologies for real-time genotyping, not a whole genome genotype of the kind that we use medically, but the kinds that law enforcement use, right, which are certainly unique identifiers uh, to the extent that a genome is, you know, a genotype is a unique identifier, which is a pretty good one, actually. <laughs> Um, so the, those technologies are being developed and even uh, deployed uh, in some places. And so would they become sort of standard in various, various contexts where the government needs control or wants control? They could. I mean, I, you know, it depends on how much people are depends on the political context of the time, right, when these things are being introduced. We know, for instance, that the government of the UK was trying to um, use genotyping, and I don't think they were doing sequencing, I'm not really sure, to ascertain the country of origin of people who were seeking entry as um, refugees. And they just, this last week or so, announced that they were abolishing that program after a lot of people told them that you couldn't you know, that you couldn't necessarily use somebody's genotype to determine what country they were actually born in since people do move around and, you know, regardless of where their ancestors were from in the intermediate past, you can't necessarily know where they were born by knowing where their ancestors were from. <laughs> um, so we know that countries are trying to use these technologies in various ways. I also know that there are companies that are trying to develop a very, you know, sort of real-time, quite sophisticated genotyping for identification purposes for people who whose identity needs to be ascertained um, in the private sector context to get access to very sensitive corporate information and things like that. So those are technologies that are, are out there, they're in development, and governments could adopt them. Um, that's about all I can say. <laughs> That's great. I, I want to thank our panel. This was a terrific session. Uh, I wish we could dive into some of these questions more uh, in depth. We are going to try to cover some of this uh, through our discussion forum on NGS Leaders. We'll be sending you guys reminders about that. It would be great to continue this conversation on the community platform. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time uh, today to join us. Uh, I know you're busy, and getting an hour out of your day is a, is a privilege for us to have you. And this will mark the end of our session. Uh, you can be on the lookout for our next, uh, our next webinar, and again, is getting on board with uh, the discussion forum uh, on the community site. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. This, this was great. And we'll also send the recording out to everyone in, in just a bit. Take All care. All right, thank you. All right, bye. Thank you, Eric. Bye. bye.